and then there is a book by good fellow Benjiu and Corville on uh, deep learning. This is a recent book, uh, which you can also go through to learn about supervised learning uh, basics. Uh, so, in general, how do we do machine learning? We first of all define the model and then to train the model, we define a loss function or an objective function. So this loss function is a function of uh, the model prediction y hat and the ground truth or the targets y. And you compare them that how closely they match. If they don't match, then you do something to update your theta parameters so that they finally can match. This is called supervised learning because your learning is supervised by the targets or the uh, ground truth y. And then uh, how do you train the model? You take, a, take the training data x comma y. These are the input output pairs. Y is the desired output. And then you uh, feed your x into the model, get your y hat, compare it with y, and then you find the loss. And then you update your loss function. Uh, you, using your loss function, you update your model with the help of some gradient descent technique. For example, stochastic gradient descent technique or uh, et cetera. There are many other variants of it available. So the general equation, uh, the weight update rule can be written like this, that my theta uh, is updated in this way, that it is the previous theta minus alpha, which is some learning rate, times the gradient of my loss function with respect to theta, which means uh, if there is some direction in which if I change my theta, loss will increase, then I will go in the opposite direction. That's why negative sign is there. This is simple gradient descent you all are familiar with. So all you need here is uh, uh, you need a differentiable loss function, which is differentiable with respect to theta. And then you need a uh, simple calculus to differentiate it and then up find the update rule and then apply it to your model. And then once you have trained your model, you can test it on a separate data set, a test set, uh, and you can measure its accuracy, mean squared error, et cetera, et cetera, depending on your problem. And this is the general supervised learning framework. Now, what are the limitations of supervised learning? Although this framework, I must uh, reiterate here, it is very powerful. So many applications you are seeing around you, many of them, maybe most of them are using supervised learning, starting from uh, Alexa, Google, and so many other services. Uh, now, what are the problems in supervised learning? One of the problems is that they need a large amount of label data for training the model, right? You need inputs and the corresponding ground truth values or the target values, why? Uh, so this could be very difficult, why? Number one, the annotations could be difficult to obtain. As you heard in the previous tutorial, for the legal cell, uh, for the legal data, uh, the speakers mentioned how difficult it is to, uh, to put proper headings, etc., and to generate ground truth for them can be very challenging and, and very uh, 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 time-consuming, labor-consuming. So manual labeling is a very big challenge. Other could other challenge could be the data itself could be very scarce. For example, you go to medical domain and you have to get data for some medical. Uh, application, it's so difficult to get the data. You have to uh, go through so many uh, proper uh, rules, uh, there are privacy issues, and then uh, the data itself might be scarce. For example, you, there, is, there may be some rare disease for which data is so uh, infrequent. And then uh, the annotations could be computationally very expensive. So this refers to mostly in, case of, in the case of simulations. You may sometimes do some simulations to generate some data and the corresponding annotations, but those annotations could be themselves very difficult. So uh, in our lab, we work on some physics problems, and these are statistical physics problems. So technically, yes, you can do simulations and generate the ground truth data and the x and y pairs, basically. But then these simulations could be very expensive, like Monte Carlo simulations, which are very expensive. Uh, and then. Another difficulty could be, uh, this is also was mentioned in the previous tutorial as well, the annotations could be changing over time. There will be new rules, new amendments, new cases coming. And similarly, in other areas, language is evolving. Let's say we work in mostly in audio domain. So we, we, we work with languages like, let's say, speech recognition. 
so languages are changing the term covid was not known before 2019 and suddenly this new term has come into the vocabulary and then quarantine and so many other terms have come in uh, so uh, and uh, another uh, a possible uh, change could come from the nature of sensors themselves for example uh, we have we have been applying uh, machine learning to sensor calibration for air quality monitoring and these sensors they they are uh, they they, sh they show a sh drift with time the characteristics change with time so any sensor is a physical device and it uh, decays with time so you have a microphone microphone characteristics also change with time so how do you take care of this changing behavior of our data so for that we cannot have large amount of data because the sensors are changing now another problem um, associated with supervised learning is uh, i can summarize it in, uh, by calling it as domain shift so even if there could be large amounts of label data available but the the distribution of target data and the source data may be different so let me simplify it what i mean uh, you may train your model on one kind of data set but the moment you take it in real world in outside uh, the nature of data is slightly different so the domain is slightly different let's say i trained it on uh, using my my microphones and then suddenly you are deploying it on mobile services so the nature of microphone has changed so quality will also change although the same word same speech and same kind of recordings but the uh, quality of microphone has changed so it may uh, give you very dif different performance and generally worse performance and this is uh, true in any domain you go we we work on so many domains and everywhere we see this problem you may train it on some kind of data set but you change the data set and the models perform very poorly and in some cases we have also seen uh, models really fail terribly on other domains because the domain shift is very large now what are the remedies uh, which are suggested here so one of the remedies is called semi supervised learning where you take uh, so this this remedy is for unlabeled data let's say or the scarcity of labeled data so what you do you you take 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 help of semi supervised learning which depends not only on labeled data but also on unlabeled data so you have lots of unlabeled data and small amount of uh, oh sorry lots of unlabeled data and small amounts of labeled data so can i leverage that unlabeled data also so let me learn something something about the structure of the input from that unlabeled data and then i kind of do simple supervised learning on that small amount of labeled data and and in practice it is seen that it improves the performance massively means there is a large improvement so this there are two kinds of methods semi uh, self supervised learning or unsupervised learning um uh, we will discuss maybe in little detail here um uh, and then we have few short learning few short learning means let's say you it's this 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 paradigm can also help you to address the domain adaptation or domain shift problem where you have lots of data from some domain you train your models let's say in a supervised fashion or whatever fashion and then you apply uh, this to a new domain which has got uh, less data so can we learn from those limited examples few shots limited examples and then we can learn efficient can we learn efficiently from them and then go forward this is few shot learning and then there are model adaptation techniques which like you train your model on some domain and then you efficiently adapt them to the new data there have been several uh, starting from simple methods like fine tune based adaptation you just do some more runs of your iterative uh, gradient descent kind of methods uh, this is called transfer learning also because you are transferring your model from one domain to another domain and then just doing some fine tuning there this ha this has also been very successful uh, recently uh, and then the other model adaptation technique which we will focus on today is meta learning so meta learning means uh, learning to learn so we'll talk more about it but let's first do a lit kind of a, a literature survey of other techniques so over to kavya
Hello. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So here. Okay. So as sir mentioned that uh, we basically. Um, what happens in fine tuning uh, method is uh, we have uh, a model pre-trained on some related tasks and that model is basically pre-trained on a large uh, amount of labeled data. Now uh, we want to just transfer this, these, the weights of these uh, pre-trained model to some other domain uh, and just fine tune on that. So basically what happens is it's a type of transfer learning and uh, so, uh, for example, here uh, we have a large network such as VGG16 networks and uh, it is basically trained on a large number of images uh, uh, such as like uh, the, uh, the data has 1000 classes. So, it's a quite large amount of labeled data. Now, uh, now what happens is we have this trained uh, uh, model and now we are trying to use this model to uh, fine tune on some other data set. So how it happens is uh, we have a model F theta X where theta is the feature extractor, feature extractor layers and uh, phi is the classification layer. So for uh, let's, let's say in the previous example uh, that VGG model, uh, we have the feature extract, uh, feature extract layers theta and uh, phi will be uh, uh, a thousand node uh, layer because they are there are thousand classes so we have uh, we have this trained uh, model and uh, yeah so uh, we will train this with a large amount of data now what happens in uh, fine tuning is uh, we we freeze the feature extractor layers, like we freeze the theta uh, layers, and then we'll discard the uh, last classifi classifier layer phi and replace it with some phi dash for uh, another um, domain and according to the number of classes present in that domain. So uh, now we will uh, freeze f theta and then we'll update the f uh, phi theta phi, da phi dash. So um, now, uh, the uh, update rule is uh, the simple uh, gradient descent method. So we'll first do few iterations of updating only the classifier layer. And then we then when we have the sufficient amount of um, updates, then we will update the whole uh, model end to end to increase the performance of the model. So this is basically um, this is basically what is fine tuning. Uh, but one limitation of fine tuning is we still need to have a large amount of data in the target domain as well to fine tune our model. Uh, but can we bring this uh, to a certain, uh, like can we, can we uh, break down this problem and work with a limited amount of data in the target domain, limited amount of uh, label data in the target domain. So uh, here, in this situation comes the few short learning. So basically it, uh, it helps in overcoming the problem of scarcity of large amount of label data. And um, so it, this method is used when we have a very few uh, label data in the target domain, like how the model can learn from very few label data. Uh, and this problem is basically uh, represented as n way k short classification problem, where n represents the number of classes and k, rep uh, k represents the number of uh, samples per class. So now how to, how to solve this problem? Basically, uh, few short learning uh, problems uh, require require some experience, uh, like uh, require a model with some experience like bef uh, beforehand. So what can, uh, how can we um, formulate this problem? Uh, so meta learning is one way to solve this problem because meta learning uh, involves learning from the experiences of the related tasks and how we can, uh, and how we can project those learnings to the target domain. So, um, 
there are two types of meta learning uh, based approaches one is metric based approach and one is the gradient based approach so like metric based approaches uh, basically uh, represent the okay so the metric based approach basically focuses on learning the distance function uh, between the so uh, between the um, su support sample and the query sample so um, okay now uh, here at this point i would like to introduce uh, you to some terminologies uh, related to meta learning what happens is we have when we have a when we say we have a task so one task is considered as an episode and that episode is divided into support set and query set okay the support set is like uh, uh, support set is the training data set uh, which uh, which is very limited in number uh, the label samples are very limited and query uh, set is the test data set uh, when we learn on the support set and then we want to uh, check the performance on the query set so um, so these these uh, two terminologies will be uh, we will be using these terminologies in the uh, further slides so there are uh, two uh, methods of meta learning one is metric based and another one is gradient based so in this tutorial we will be focusing on the gradient based meta learning and that algorithm is called model agnostic meta learning okay so uh, what happens in matching networks this is the first metric based method uh, used to solve the few shot learning problem so what happens is uh, we have uh, we have uh, many samples from the support set as you can see on the left hand side of the image uh, we have four classes and we have one sample uh, or or we can have uh, like to uh, k k short uh, i mean k can be two or three three samples per class so we have these uh, images and these are the, uh, this comprises the support set now what happens is there is this framework called g theta which basically uh, finds the embeddings of the uh, support samples and uh, we have this query uh, image uh, we have this query image now that query uh, so uh, we will basically find the embeddings of the support uh, support images as well as the query images and then we will try to find the cosine distance between uh, the query images and all the samples uh, in the support set and uh, basically then we will uh, use the uh, softmax activation function to find out the similarity and uh, and the cross entropy loss is used to update the whole uh, network so basically this matching networks uh, focuses on finding the um, like update uh, it basically focuses on learning the embeddings of the uh, images so that the query the query sample which is close to whichever embedding uh, uh, the that query sample belongs to that particular class so this is what matching networks looks like if anybody wants to read that in detail we have the uh, this paper uh, refresh to this paper so you can uh, have a look here also a prototypical uh, network is another type of uh, network which helps in solving the future learning problem it is almost similar to matching networks but there is a slight difference the difference is that here we do not consider all the samples uh, like the query the query data is not matched is not uh, matched with all the samples in the support set we instead we have here are the class prototypes so what is class prototypes it means that for a particular class if there are uh, if there are like five samples per class so we will take the average of those uh, images uh, the embeddings of those uh, images and then we will uh, and then we will uh, basically match uh, the distance between the query sample and those class prototypes and here the uh, the distance function is not cosine function it is basically euclidean distance so that was a one that was one more uh, improvement uh, that we we saw while using the prototypical networks and the reference to the same network has been uh, given here uh, so feel free to check this out 
Okay, so the last method is the relation networks. So this basically combines uh, the matching networks and the prototypical networks. So uh, now what happens is here uh, we have we have the class prototypes and we get the embeddings of those class prototypes and then we will have the embedding of the query set as well the query sample so we uh, so there is this relation module which we have which basically concatenates the class prototypes and the embedding or, and the query embedding and then it it basically finds the relation uh, between uh, how similar uh, are those so this uh, G5 is the relation module that we have here and uh, uh, then basically uh, we will get some scores and then uh, by applying the softmax activation we can find the um, we can find which query sample is similar to the uh, to the support sample or the support class so these three uh, networks basically solve the uh, future learning problem in a metric based uh, way now we will uh, see the gradient based methods uh, of uh, solving the future learning problem that is uh, the meta uh, the model agnostic meta learning algorithm so um, so yeah so what is meta learning meta learning is basically a learning to learn algorithm and we can learn like we can learn multiple things like such as we can uh, learn the optimal model initialization we can learn the optimum optimal learning method also and we can basically learn the optimal optimal uh, optimal hyperparameters also like so uh, basically what happens is uh, when we have a given uh, model so um, like these three methods uh, can be uh, can be learned uh, while training the model so that basically improves the performance uh, much more and uh, during the hands-on session we can see how uh, well uh, the model performs when we are uh, when we are using the model agnostic meta learning and uh, in this tutorial we will be focusing on the optimal model initialization method so uh, Okay, so I'll just invite Vipul sir for the theory of meta learning. Thanks, Kavya. Um, okay, as Kavya explained in the previous slide, uh, what is meta learning? Meta learning is learning to learn algorithm. So we saw in supervised learning, we learn the theta parameters of the model F or the weights of the network or could be anything. So that is what we learn during our training. But there are many things in that model which we, do, we didn't learn. For example, how do you initialize that model? Or what, are the, what is the learning rate? Or some other uh, things which were taken as fixed. For ex they are called hyperparameters. Or how did you decide the model uh, size, etc. So those, are all, th th those were not learned when we uh, trained our model with gradient descent. And also, uh, how, how about the optimization algorithm? What algorithm are you using? So those things were not learned. But in meta learning, you try to learn even those things that what are those things? If I learn them, then I can learn any new task uh, much more efficiently. So this is meta learning. And let's see the some theory. How do you so mostly I have seen uh, people they apply meta learning to learn the initial state of the model. Can we initialize the model in such a way that it can very quickly learn a new task? Uh, let's take a simple example. Let's say image classification. You want to, maybe you're designing a biometric system. You want to recognize your own face. And you open your phone. Let, phones have face recognition systems. So they quickly adapt to your face, right? Can I make an, uh, a model which can quickly learn anybody's face just with a few examples? This could be one model task you may consider. Now, let's see the theory of meta-learning. Um, so let's uh, see some terminology first. Uh, so we are focusing on model agnostic meta-learning, which means I can use any architecture, CNN, RNN, dense layers, et cetera, et cetera. Or, uh, so that is, not, um, uh, uh, that is not an issue. You can apply meta-learning to any of that model. 
so let's do some see some terminology we have something called a source domain and something called a target domain we have discussed this let's say you are training in some data set that is your source domain and you are deploying in real world or maybe some on, on some other data set you are testing that could be your target domain so these things you have to define uh, and they are very flexible and then within each source domain you can have multiple tasks uh, now we are doing meta learning means we are learning to learn so let's uh first create a large number of tasks which our model needs to learn I means uh, uh, one by one so let's call them as episodes so e1 e2 e3 these are the episodes in the source domain uh, i will give an example let's say uh, you take your uh, face recognition algorithm and recognizing the face of mr x that is one task. Recognizing the face of Mr. Y, another task. Mr. Z, another task. So in this way, you create multiple, multiple tasks. Um, and then for each task or each episode, you have a, a training data and a test data. So let's call it as support set and query set, as Kavya explained. So uh, you have uh, for every task, support set and query set. Now, the thing is, when you are meta training your system uh, you have the target labels for not only support set but also for the query set this is you can consider this is your development data set and part of this is your test data set means you have the labels for support set but not for the query set so the question is the or the machine learning problem we formulated uh, is that given all this label data and labels for the support sets in this target domain. How do you estimate the labels for uh, query domain, uh, query set, query set in the target in the in the target domain, right? We have the labels here, 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 and we want and here on all the S. But on Q, what are the labels? I don't know. We have to predict that. Right? That is the machine learning problem. Now, how do we approach it? So let's start with simple. Uh, supervised learning kind of framework. We have a model F theta E. Theta E is episode specific parameters, right? Task specific parameters. So theta E, depending on the value of E, theta will change. But we have to initialize the parameters for each task with some initial theta. Let's call it as theta naught. Theta naught is my initial model parameters, and theta E are the task specific model parameters which are learned starting from theta naught okay now how do we update theta e we all know we are we have used simply gradient descent algorithm where we have uh, theta e minus some learning rate times derivative of the loss function with respect to theta e right so please uh, consider every notation here is little important so but i am trying to explain it in as simple way as possible as i can um, and you are training this, uh, you are, you're computing this loss function on the, on the support set for, for the task E, right? Now let's see, uh, this is the normal supervised learning framework, which you all know. What is meta learning here? Now this is meta learning. I want to train my theta naught also, my initial, initial model parameters where I start. So even that I want to train. How do I train them? I train them on the query set. How? I take the model. Uh, let's say I take the first task, recognizing the face of Mr. X. So I train the model on a few samples of Mr. X, and then I test it on, I test the model on the other samples from Mr. X. And I check whether it has learned nicely or not. If it has not learned nicely, what do I do? I will not update the model. I will update the theta naught. This is called meta learning. I will use that performance to update my theta naught. This is meta learning. Uh, I will repeat again. So let's say you take the task. Task is recognizing the face of Mr. X. And you train the model from the limited samples of Mr. X, starting from some theta naught. And this is how you train on the support set. And then on the query set, you uh, check the performance. How is the performance? If the performance is good, very nice. If performance is not good, then update what? Not theta e, but theta naught. Update your initial model itself. This is meta learning. Okay. So uh, summarizing. So we train our 
uh, theta e on the support set, but we train our theta naught on the query set. Let's see a uh, little bit uh, picture, pictorially. Uh, so we have uh, starting from some theta naught. This is our theta naught meta learner or our uh, initial model. We feed this model for a particular task E. And we have XS and YS are the data from support set. We train our theta, which means it becomes theta E, the base learner. And then this theta E is tested on the query set. I get the estimates for the query set, compare it with the ground truth of the query set, and whatever was the loss function, I use it to update my theta naught. Okay. So I hope this is clear. This is called meta training. Now, what do I do with my new theta naught? So I have to do meta testing. Okay. So some terminology which is popular in literature. So generally, this kind of Training my base learner or training my task specific model is called inner loop optimization. Whereas training my initializer or the meta model, that is called outer loop optimization. Just the terminology. So this is the meta training framework. And now let's see the complete picture. So I ho this whole exercise on the source domain, what does it return? What does it give to me finally? it gives me a theta e. No, I do, I'm not concerned with theta e's. I'm concerned with theta naught. It will give me a good initial model, which I can use to now uh, initialize and train on any new task, which means the face of Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C, which I have never seen before. Uh, so now what happens in the uh, meta testing time. This is called meta testing, meta training, meta testing. In meta testing, I will use my theta naught, bring it to uh, initialize my model. Now this model, I will train on the support set of the new task. Let's say you bought a new phone, Mr. A bought the new phone. Now Mr. A will give some images of his face on which the model can train itself. That is the support set here. Oops, sorry. That is the support set on which we have the input as well as output uh, la labeled uh, data. I train my base learner using the theta naught I trained here. Uh, now I will test it on the query set of the new phase, Mr. A, right? So, and the, this performance is what should be good. It means finally I evaluate my whole meta learning framework on the performance of this step that how well now my model is able to perform on the new task after being trained on the few samples from that new task. So this is the overall meta learning framework. Now let's go to the next slide. Uh, so this algorithm, you can summarize it like this. Um, you have several tasks. These tasks you have to create. Nobody will tell you. You have to create for your own problem. Uh, and then Alpha and beta are the learning rates. Alpha is the learning rate for your base model, and th beta is the learning rate for your. Oh, this should be beta, right? This sorry, this is the typo here. This is the beta. Beta is the learning rate for your meta model. And and then in the meta testing task, a meta test meta testing time, uh, you take tasks which were uh, new tasks. You have the support set for training. You train your only the base learner. Don't train your meta learner. You don't train your meta learner now. So you train your base learner and then test it on the query set. And that performance is what will finally tell whether your model is good or not, or whether your whole <laughs> algorithm is good or not. Okay. Now we applied this method in our lab. Like Kavya applied this to uh, melody extraction. So what is melody extraction? You have music and Music is audio and audio, everything is uh, like a waveform, but you want to extract what notes the person is singing or what notes the uh, main instrument is playing. And the challenge is that there are background instruments. There are other people also uh, singing along probably. Uh, so how do you extract the main melody of the song? And we applied several approaches there. We applied simple uh, supervised learning, we uh, tried fine tuning based learning, we tried meta learning, and we found that meta learning does give a boost. 
Now the question which we faced here is how do we define our tasks? Should I say every uh, every singer is a new task or should I say every recording is a new task or should I say every genre is a new task? So what is my task here? So the answer is you decide for yourself what you call as a new task. So we uh, tested with considering every song as a new task and that's how we tested our model and it worked well. Uh, another domain where we applied this meta learning is for sensor calibration. Okay, now what is the difference? The melody extraction was treated as a classification problem where we are trying to uh, uh, predict discrete notes or discrete um, like MIDI numbers. But here in sensor calibration, the output, uh, it's a regression task. The output is a continuous value. What is the, let's say, temperature outside or what is the level of pollution outside, right? So this is a continuous task, uh, uh, sorry, it's a regression task. And we, we can apply meta learning to regression tasks also. There have been more works on classification tasks than on regression tasks, but in principle, both are possible and both work. Um, okay, now I hope you all have understood meta learning very well. And generally this is what you get from the papers, from the books. And now, but when you really sit down to apply these techniques to your problem, what problem you will face? Uh, is it really easy what you learned? Did you miss something? Uh, so when we sat down with pencil and paper and we found out that there were many gray areas which we did not understand from the papers. So let's see some of them. So let's start with a simple problem. Take a simple linear regression problem and apply meta learning to it. And we'll see the difficulties which we will face here. So we have taken a simple linear model, which uh, or basically linear regression, where we have a linear model and then a simply a sigmoid nonlinearity on top of it. That's our model. So x is the input. Uh, it's a scalar input. Y hat is the output, a scalar output. And a, b are the two parameters of the model. And sigmoid nonlinearity is the standard thing which you know already. This is our model. Now. Uh, a, B are the model parameters. I want to uh, not learn them, but meta learn them. Means basically I want to learn an initializer for these models. Uh, so consider a loss function as Y minus Y hat whole square. Let's say it's a regression problem. So mean squared error is a sensible loss function to take. Uh, now Y is the target value, Y hat is a predicted output, okay. Now our goal in this exercise is to mathematically derive the meta learning equations for the parameter b, which means I want to learn the initializer b0, which can initialize b so that b can adapt to a new task, uh, which means we can know be, the task specific be, uh, very easily. So let's uh, try to derive. Okay, the overall framework you already know. Uh, now our model is simply be, the base learner is be, and the meta model is b0. So let's try to derive the equations from scratch. Uh, the simple equation for uh, updating our weights, BE is BE minus alpha, alpha is a learning rate, times the derivative of the loss function with respect to BE. Now, is this loss function a function of BE? Uh, yes, this loss function has Y minus Y hat. Y is not a function of BE, but, but Y hat is a function of BE, why? Because Y hat is, you know, sigmoid of, a plus B X. So yes, it is a function of B E. So uh, taking a derivative is simple. Uh, let's see what the derivative is. So, okay. So to, to, to take the derivative of L loss function, we can take, we can apply chain rule, right? Where do L upon do Y hat and then do Y hat upon do B E. And each of these terms can be very simply calculated like this. So my do L upon do Y E is simply Y minus Y hat. Uh, uh, square derivative, which is simply this. And then the next term, do, B, do y upon do b e. And since do y is sigmoid of a plus b x, so derivative of this is also very easy to compute. Uh, it is simply y minus y hat, uh, y into one minus y hat at times x. All uh, right, this is very simple. Uh, you already know from your machine learning lessons. Now you can put these two equations back in your original update rule and you, you get this very simple update rule, right? Your BE is simply uh, updated in this way.
Now let's come to the meta learning part. Is that simple? Outer loop optimization. So now you see this, I have to update my B naught on the query set. Uh, I have to train it on the query set. So I say B naught is B naught minus some learning rate alpha or beta, whatever. And derivative of the loss function on the query set is uh, with respect to the parameter B naught. Now the question is, is my Y hat a function of B naught? Yes, it is a function of B E and the B E was derived from B naught some time ago <laughs> in the previous iterations. Uh, so let's uh, expand this derivative using chain rule, do L upon do Y hat, do Y hat upon do B E and B E is a function of B naught. Now these two terms are easy to compute. You can say do L upon do Y hat is simply twice of y minus y hat. And then do y hat upon do b is also known. You have done it before. Now, what about the third term? How do we compute this do b e upon do b naught? So this is where meta learning comes in, means the real contribution of meta learning is here. So let's, let's uh, try to write b e in terms of b naught. Uh, so if we see the original equation, my b e was, B naught minus some learning rate. Oh, it was alpha before. You made it gamma. Okay, it, it should be alpha. Uh, let's say okay, gamma, some some learning rate times the derivative of loss function with respect to B naught. And this loss function was computed at B naught. So this is true if we had only single update. Means deriving B E from B naught using only single update no multiple updates, only single update, single iteration. Then this equation is true. But if we had multiple updates, then this would become even more complicated, right? Because B will be some, let's say, B E dash times this, and B E dash is a function of B naught. So it becomes multiple layers of uh, derivatives coming in. So, but for sake of simplicity, let's do only single update here. And now let's try to see what is the derivative of BE with respect to B naught? From here, it's simple to see. So it is one minus uh, the learning rate times squared derivative, basically double derivative of loss function with respect to B naught. So uh, this double derivative thing, uh, it helps learning uh, more than what we do in supervised learning. In supervised learning, we in, in the general domain, we just see the first order derivatives, but here we have second order or third order or even higher order derivatives, depending on how many updates you have done here. So you can have higher order derivatives and this helps uh, you to learn faster or makes your learning more efficient. Now let's compute this uh, higher order derivatives here. So if you see do B upon do B naught, okay, basically you want to compute derivative of the loss function with respect to B naught twice. So the first time when we computed the derivative with respect to B naught, it was this term. We have seen this in the past. Now we have to take derivative of this term with respect to B naught. Now you see it's not, again not simple, right? Because y hat is a function of B naught. Uh, and this is a complex function of y hat itself. Three times y hat is appearing. Let's try to again use uh, chain rule to take the derivative. Uh, so it becomes three times because there are three y hat terms. So you get three uh, derivatives here, uh, three terms here in the derivative. And if you simplify this, this becomes something like this, where you can see higher order terms in terms of y hat are also appearing. And putting all these equations together, we get this equation. So you see our learning rule has uh, changed from a simple uh, learning rule to very complicated, even for a linear model or, or basically linear model plus some sigmoid nonlinearity. Even for that kind of model, the learning rule, rule has become very complicated. Uh, so now imagine when you apply it to a real neural network, <laughs> it will become much more complicated. So we generally do it, don't do it by hand. We use the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call optimizers, no, the, Auto differentiation, thank you. <laughs> the auto differentiation uh, methods available in uh, libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. So we rely on them and we try to compute these derivatives there. Uh, it's again complicated. So even because generally in 
machine learning we generally see first order derivatives but then going to higher order derivatives many times we make mistake i have my practical experience many of my students who were working on meta learning they made mistakes and they could not do it because this uh, this thing is not very common in machine learning uh, generally okay now uh, summarizing um, what are the advant okay let's say some advantages of meta learning so we get higher model prediction accuracy of course um, many other things are involved but if we tune everything properly then we can get a boost in our performance we uh, are optimizing our learning algorithms hel helping learning algorithms better adapt to changes in the conditions so one good advantage which meta learning gives is it can even work for uh, drift when our models or not the models but the data itself is drifting i gave the example in uh, sensor calibration so we have done practically in our lab our sensors are changing with time but by using meta learning with very less amount of supervised learning across time we can uh, keep up with those changes our model can quickly adapt to those changes and can still uh, help the prediction to be good uh, and then faster and cheaper training process uh, okay the competitions are little little more involved but then what is the gain the gain is in terms of data you you need less amount of data for training your model and you have uh, yeah basically that is the uh, advantage and then you get more generalized models which can quickly learn from a new task so with that we will now move to a hands on session where we will be presenting a, a jupyter notebook and to make this uh, tutorial more more hands on we have taken very uh, simple example we have taken simple the simply the mnist data which all of you are familiar with it's simple 28 cross 28 uh, grid and each grid uh, has a number handwritten digit uh, so what we have done in this example is we have divided our to create basically the meta learning kind of uh, scenario we have divided our data into two parts the source domain and the target domain our source domain are the first uh, eight digits and target domain is the next two digits so total 10 digits are there so we create source domain and target domain in this fashion and then from each source domain we create multiple tasks uh, i think that we have created a ta every task is a, a, a binary classification problem kavya is it binary or ternary uh, yeah. binary binary classification problem where you are just uh, classifying whether this digit is one or two that's it's a binary classification task um, so and we randomly sample the pairs of the digits and then we create these tasks randomly uh, of course, we sample the digits, uh, the labels, as well as the data randomly to create some tasks. And then we test it on the other two digits, which were not used for source domain. So I give to Kavya to continue. Thank you, sir. Okay. So uh, here, as sir explained, uh, we are considering the MNIST data for uh, the hands-on session uh, on meta learning. So uh, so initially uh, we divide the data set into the source and uh, the target domain, right? So here we are considering first eight classes as the source domain and the uh, last two classes as the uh, target domain uh, 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 for, for this uh, session. Because uh, since all these are, uh, you know, numbers, numbers only, uh, the MNIST data consists of numbers. So we are just dividing this data set into the source and target uh, data set. So uh, here, okay. So uh, first we will import all the libraries that uh, we need for this task. And uh, okay, so here uh, we are using a CNN model. Uh, so basically it's a, it's a five layer CNN model and then we have a dense layer uh, and uh, uh, so basically we build a class uh, so that uh, we can easily uh, discard, you know, uh, the classifier layer and uh, uh, basically uh, I mean, update the update the number of classes as per the task that we will we we will be considering, right? So, uh, so this uh, here we made this call function where we will uh, 
basically it is used for the forward pass and uh, so basically this is the model uh, okay so yeah this is the model and uh, the number of parameters that we have it's the number of trainable parameters is like 15 lakhs so we will be training the we will be training this model for the meta learning so here i have basically uh, made few functions uh, we will not be using the inbuilt functions for uh, the training purposes because when we will be using meta learning we will need uh, you know uh, double differentiation as sir told in the equation that we uh, just saw in the uh, derivation so for that uh, we cannot use the inbuilt functions for updating the uh, like uh, updating the model so i have made these custom functions uh, so that we can uh, basically use these uh, and uh, okay now here we will uh, here we will uh, load our mnist data and uh, as you all know uh, these are the uh, these are the binary images i mean the grayscale images uh, because there is no uh, there is single channel there is no rgb channel so uh, so here are few plots of the images that we have in the data set now in this section i am basically uh, what i'm doing is i'm uh, segregating the data class wise okay and i'm considering only 500 samples per class uh, so i have made this class wise underscore x is a, is a list of list and uh, in this block i am just basically uh, uh, I'm just basically, uh, uh, I mean, appending all the samples for that particular class. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's a list of lists, so every index is a class. Uh, uh, is a class, and at that particular class, I have 500 samples. So, um, okay, now here, uh, basically, I am. Uh, Okay, so there are there are total five thousand samples uh, for all the ten class. I mean, for all the ten classes, and uh, and in these functions, basically, I am uh, dividing the data like for for each task. Like for pre-training, I have uh, for for pre-training module, I have uh, the particular uh, data set that I'll be using, and uh, for fine-tuning, I have another data set. Another data set in the sense uh, derived from uh, this particular MNIST only. So uh, for for normal pre-training my module, uh, as I told you, my source data set was uh, total eight classes, first eight classes of the uh, data set. So here I am just uh, basically uh, getting together all the samples from uh, the eight classes first eight classes and this function i'll let you i'll discuss later because this is uh i need it when i'll be doing doing fine tuning and stuff these two blocks i'll be discussing in a while and uh, okay so here pre-training uh so this is a function of pre-training we will uh, basically do this uh, on the support set of the average data and uh, now once we have uh, basically up, uh, updated the model on this particular data set i mean trained the model on this particular data set now we will be using the trained model and uh, we will be using this trained model and then we will fine tune on the uh, the target data set now for the similarity for the uh, sake of uh, you know having uh, fair comparison between the fine tuning method and the meta learning method what we have considered here is uh, as in meta learning we have very few samples in the support set of the target domain uh, i repeat we have very few samples in the support set of the target domain so here i'm considering only um, like five samples per class which means in my uh, target domain there are two classes classes 8 and 9 and i'm taking five samples each from eight class uh, from class 8 and class 9 so i have total of 10 samples uh, for the uh, 
support set of the target domain so we will be fine tuning on this data target data uh, i mean support set of the target data and then we will check we will verify the performance on the uh, query set of the target data which are which is the uh, rest of the images uh, uh, for that but for those particular classes eight and nine so like is it is the uh, like distribution clear what i'm trying to do yeah anybody yeah okay sure Uh, I would. We would like to pause here, uh, and we would like to invite questions. If you have, you can ask now, and then we will move forward to this example, and also we will uh, show the performance with this task. Okay. The question is on the uh, screen. Is there a GitHub link to the Jupyter notebook? Yes, we will share it with you. Thank you. We will. We will share. Maybe you can. You you have you can share it now also. No. Okay, so uh, in the meanwhile, while I take questions, Kavya can share the link on. Uh, you have the Zoom also on. Okay, she'll share it on Zoom. Uh, okay, maybe uh, somebody can help me. Yeah. Uh, Shirsha can help. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, so, thank you for the presentation. So, this in this query set, can you explain what the query set look like? Like, for example, they have this uh, data classes, like the images will be there. And is it a classification task now? So this is a classification. Then. And the labels will be all 10 labels, like 0 to no. 9. So what no. will be there? Only two labels, so either when, digit A or digit B. That's it. So say, for example, the uh, support is like 5 in the, the No, source. support, see, the task is same in the support set and query set. For each E episode, for each episode or for each task, the, the task is same. Let's say the task is classify one from two, right? And the support set will have images of one, images of two. Query set will also have images of one, images of two. But support set has labels, query set may not have labels, right? I see, I see. Right? So in the uh, target set now, this uh, they will have two, uh, uh, task identifying eight and no, there will be only be one task identifying eight and nine. Uh, yes, there is only single task possible. Yes, yes, which is identifying eight and nine. Yeah, yeah, but we can create iterations. Let's say take some different samples of eight and nine for training and testing, and then another uh, random sampling of some other samples of eight and nine in this problem. Okay, okay. So, yeah. You can also tell your name. Uh, thank you, sir. So my name is Konte Devedi. And uh, my question is regarding the uh, derivation process that you showed. Uh, the tutorial showed that the derivation was for only one iteration. That is why there was a uh, second order derivative. But uh, uh, in practice, you said that there would be multiple iterations. So how is theta not actually going to get uh, computed there in practice? In every iteration, are we computing the theta not? Yeah, basically you apply chain rule. That's the thing. It's so uh, I mean, if we are going to apply the chain rule, then it would be really very complicated, as you said. Like uh, for every epoch you are seeing, in every epoch we are going to compute theta naught. So if there would be like hundred epochs, then uh, the chain rule. I mean, the derivation derivative okay. would be for hundred order derivative. Yeah. So basically, don't update your theta that infrequently. Update it more frequently. Let's huh. say after every uh, inner loop. Uh, optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say every iteration of inner loop, you may do one outer loop optimization. Right, right. right. right okay. Or else maybe two inner loop uh, uh, iterations, then one of outer okay, loop okay, okay. iteration. So like so, that, you can try to. Otherwise, I mean, what I was thinking that if after every epoch we are computing theta naught, then uh, how would it, it would be different from the ordinary learning process where we are actually computing the theta e. There is I think uh, you are confused, confusing between epoch and iteration. Yes, yes, yes that uh, is epoch I mean. means how many samples we have. We can have yeah. all the samples in single up update, but uh, iterations means how many times you are applying this uh, gradient descent. No, no, I am okay. actually talking about that loss only, okay. the gradient descent process okay. only. Huh. So, I mean, but you have actually cleared it. Thank you so much. You have said that uh, after two, two or three inner loops, we can actually compute the theta naught. Yeah, yeah, that yes. would be fine. Thank you, yes. sir. Thank you. Um, uh, 
hello sir thank you for the uh, for a wonderful tutorial so i just wanted to ask so is there any advantage of meta learning when we don't have less data like uh, in a simple scenario we have data so uh, so is there any advantage of meta learning because if we i take the example of mnist okay so we we separated the class in source data and the target data however in the like in the real world we need given a digit we want to know what digit it is yeah. we won't take the only classes from the target domain we have to combine it with this source domain classes as well mm -hmm. so good question so i just mm -hmm. wanted to ask uh, if i have data so because of this uh, because we are taking the multi derivative thing so is there any advantage of meta learning um, yeah so yeah. i just wanted to know your views on sure, this sure sure good question uh, yes so if you have lots of data that's very nice but the problem will come when you will apply it to some real problem let's say you train it on mnist now you with your own hand write a digit make it into 24 cross 24 grid and put it in your model is it able to classify your way of writing one may be different so there may be slight domain shift because of your hand writing which is different now go to other alphabets don't write 1 2 3 right maybe in hindi one and this two in hindi uh, script or the uh, devnagari script or you go to some other script or go to character rec recognition let's say don't write 1 2 3 write a b c or a r e e right so that there it will be useful and so basically these two areas i told one is the when the domain is very different the other is that uh the even the language changes domain is different means let's say you the user is different or uh, the devices are different you may use a, a finer pen to write whereas mnist was a thicker pen so this kind of variations or the language itself instead of hindi instead of english you write in hindi or things like that in all of these cases the data would be limited right yeah then data will be limited in the target domain okay oh. yeah uh, hello so uh, i wanted to know one thing that uh, uh do you think that there is a problem of catastrophic forgetting or catastrophic interference uh in this transfer learning uh where uh, the parameters which are updated in a uh, in a current task uh there is a chance that when we go back to the previous task then those parameters are actually overwritten uh so uh then the accuracy might be very badly affected basically so what are is uh, what are your takes on that like how do you solve this problem of catastrophic forgetting so that when we go back to the past once again uh try to like you know apply our model uh should we be achieving the same results close to the ground truth in the past because this is a very great as uh, we'll keep on facing the tasks you now they will keep on coming so uh, have you actually uh, i mean uh, looked into that direction so i hope i'm clear with my question yeah, yes good good point very good point so i'll just give a brief uh, background of this question so this idea of catastrophic forgetting it comes in sequential learning where you are learning one task and then moving on to the next task next task next task by the time you reach let's say 10th task you may have forgotten your first task so this is called catastrophic forgetting because you have learned something new but forgotten something old completely or very badly so this is catastrophic forgetting so the question is does it affect meta learning so the um, so we have so right now we are focusing on scenarios where we don't do sequential learning we just want to learn uh, like all the tasks are simultaneously present and we want to learn one general model which can generalize to different all these tasks properly so we have not looked at the sequential learning aspects of this yet but uh, how do we handle it is we uh, uh kind of uh, uh, don't do sequential learning but but we do uh we learn from all the data at once so that's how we handle it but of course this is a very interesting problem and there are works on online meta learning where they try to address these issues thank you uh, uh, sorry uh, this question in this is just one uh, reply to what she asked so one of the things that we faced in our production was that we wanted to update the models and we do it on the g cloud and whenever we do it from the you know ground up the cost is enormous pardon the cost is enormous for the training so uh, mm -hmm. if we are doing from the theta e and going up it is not feasible yes. so you need to actually do something like this so that it comes to like 1/10th of the cost and that's 
for a startup like us this is like gold yeah. thanks thank you thank you Hi. So you mentioned uh, in your talk that one of the applications uh, could be to detect drift in the data set that the algorithm is learning from. Um, so, and you also mentioned this, this example where you were trying to detect uh, this drift uh, for the PM two point five filter. Uh, does meta learning require uh, you to perform uh, change point detection? Ex uh, explicitly because there's this requirement of task definition beforehand. Mm. So is the uh, is that a limitation in such circumstances? G good question. Yeah, meta learning on its own does not detect change points, mm. but you can augment it with other techniques to see the current performance. And Kavya is currently working on something like that to detect when our model actually needs training. Okay, but in the existing work that you uh, showcased here. Um, what do you use to define the tasks then for drift detection? OK, so uh, we have worked on different domains. So as I told in music uh, for melody extraction, we consider each ta each uh, song or each recording as a different task. Oh, okay. But you may also consider every singer as a different task if you have that much of data. Uh, if you, you can also consider every uh, genre as a different task. So that's up to you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. There's a question at the back, and uh, he has been waiting for quite some time. Uh, hello, sir. This is Anil. Uh, actually, I have a question related to divergence. So the one of the benefit of the metric learning based approach is we can explicitly measure the divergence between the two tasks and decide whether there exists, can we learn on the target domain or not. But in the case, in this approach, I see uh, there is no explicit measure of divergence between the two tasks and whether we can really apply meta learning on the target domain or not. Yes. So is there any way to measure, the, explain this thing, whether uh, this worked because of uh, there is low divergence or can we explicitly measure this divergence in this kind of approaches? Um, I have seen divergence related works separately, but uh, with meta learning, of course, they can be very easily clubbed together, but um, I'm not aware of such works uh, yet. Maybe if you come across some, then do share with us. Okay, maybe I will for others, I will just tell the background of the question that let's say when we are training on some particular domain and how far is the target domain from the source domain? That is the question. And to measure it or to quantify that distance, there is something called divergence measures or there are many techniques used. And so I think uh, that's what you are referring to. And my answer is that, uh, yes, both these approaches like meta learning and measurement of divergence can be combined to make something uh, there, but uh, I am not aware of such works yet. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Prathamesh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so curious about the so as we saw in the derivation, the the, the complexity in the the gradient descent step and theta naught increases drastically uh, with with the number of uh, iterations. Yeah. So uh, is, is there any work on reducing that, that complexity or does it affect in practice at all? Um, generally, how many iterations do you use? One or two? How many in the inner loop? In the inner loop. Uh, like, uh, generally, I use five to ten. Five to ten, okay. So generally, Kavya uses five to ten iterations in the inner loop and that does not affect the accuracy that much. Okay. Um, that, or rather, that is computationally feasible, I would say. Yes. So I was just curious as to are there uh, techniques such as Bayesian optimization? Explored? Are, you, are you aware of any such techniques which try to uh, kind of simplify the computations for this higher order derivatives when you do the outer loop optimization? No. Okay. So not aware of any such techniques, but maybe you can uh, work on it and let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Re very relevant question. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, hello, sir. My name is Nadim, and I just uh, wanted to know in the end, as a summary. So, ca can you mention two, three, I mean, four, five things that if this this is your situation, then you should go for meta learning. For example, you mentioned okay, if the data set is less in the target domain, then you should go for. There are, I mean, certain prerequisite. Okay, if your application lies, it looks like this, then you should go for uh, meta learning to solve it. Um. 
yeah, one is that number of tasks is very large, right? And the, let's say the target domain you have unseen. Like I give ex give example of mobile phone detecting your face. So you, there are so many users and you don't have data from all the users. So this kind of problems, meta learning is very useful. And um, um, uh, also I mentioned about when the sensors or some detectors are changing with time or they have their own peculiar characteristics and you can't train the model on every possible sensor in the world. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's where meta learning becomes very useful. So I think you can explore, I, I'm sure you can find many more uh, applications in your own domain. Any more? Uh, hi, sir. Thank you for the talk. So I work in the field of brain computer interfaces and uh, my question is more towards the application of meta learning. So uh, what we typically do is that we train on, say, train a motor task, say, finger digit classification on one person. And uh, I mean, uh, according to what I, uh, what I gathered from the talk, we, we can uh, train on a few people and then we can meta learn on... Uh, uh, during production but my question is that uh, we all know that there's a neural plasticity happening that right? uh, the representations in the brain keep changing uh, so does meta learning algorithm account for the changes uh, good question uh, so i can relate your uh, point with the uh, drift point that our, even our data sets are drifting our data is drifting because the same person because of neuroplasticity his responses will be changing with time so yes yeah. so uh, i will just summarize uh, the problem the in bci you have eeg uh, sensors and uh, every person will have a different kind of uh, output means uh, uh, similar but then there are many differences and the performance varies across subjects uh, drastically so their meta learning is very useful in fact uh, one of my students who finished his phd now he was working on this bci problem and uh, he was telling me all those challenges or we discussed those challenges but we have not applied meta learning there yet maybe you can try this uh, and the other point is that the same person uh, maybe uh, change the the neuro responses may be changing with time so yes meta learning can be very useful there as well Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. What is the convergence condition here? I mean, when do we stop the iterations? Um, good point. So mostly our goal is to optimize for a particular task only. And once we, basically all our Convergence will be decided by how well it is doing on the current task. But that won't that trigger an overfit situation um, on a new task? The theta E will overfit to the task E, yeah. but theta naught won't. But, but how do we ensure the generalized? Uh, when we trained system? our theta naught, we have to keep the E's used for meta training sufficiently diverge so that they don't overfit to one specific area. Can we call this as, you know, uh, using the uh, the second set as a validation set yeah. for training theta naught, yes. uh, right? What if we use the target itself as a validation set to train the theta naught? Uh, within the target domain, you may have some validation data, yes. Like you have support set and query set. You can divide your support set in, into two parts, training and validation. And you can do validation within that support set itself. No, no, my question is slightly different. So with this uh, example, you said zero to seven is your uh, uh, meta learning part. The source and, domain. Yeah, meta and, and then eight and nine is your target domain. Yes. My question is, what if we use samples from eight and nine to train uh, and use it as a validation to train the meta learner? Okay. We generally use these samples in the inner loop optimization mm -hmm. or task specific optimization. Right? Uh, when we are doing meta testing, that time we can use it as validation set. Now, your, your question is that can we use it as validation set even for yes. meta training? The outer loop. Yeah, the outer loop optimization. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Have you explored that? Oh, so we haven't explored that, but yes, I think why not? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good point. Yeah, uh, so thanks for the talk. Uh, my question was about, uh, so 
meta learning, we see this uh, recently in a lot of uh, really uh, interesting projects, such as uh, in very large uh, language models, where we have a singular model. Our companies are trying to have a singular model for uh, translating between several languages, where we see like uh, several different traits from meta learning being employed. So, uh, this plus uh, zero shot learning or few shot learning as well. So in that way, uh, recently there was a proposal uh, by uh, Jan Lekens group uh, about uh, JEPA, if you have heard of it. Uh, basically, it's an energy-based model, and then it combines predictive as well. So JEPA is essentially joint emitting uh, predictive architecture. So uh, they sort of combine energy-based models and uh, the predictive nature of what I would essentially call a sort of time series. So this sort of encodes this. Uh, you talked about drift, for instance. So that is another thing that they're trying to uh, combat in that uh, setup. So if you have any thoughts on that. I missed the, miss the last part of your question, please. So, so the question is, is essentially if you have any thoughts on how JPA is trying to combat similar problems that you face in uh, meta learning. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with JEPA, so I... Oh, okay, that's fine. So, uh, essentially, that's a very recent development. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Uh, I'm sorry. I will look yeah, into it. Fine. And <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, I have two questions. The first one is on metric learning. So, you said that you use some metrics in order to do some meta learning. Uh, is there is that an essentiality key? The metric has to be differentiable or maybe it can be non-differentiable. Uh, by something by metric, like you mean the loss function? Yeah, so you said that there are two kinds of learning. Okay. The other is gradient-based meta learning. So in metric-based meta learning, is it necessary for the metric to be differentiable just in supervised learning? As in supervised learning. Kavya, you want to answer this question? What for? What did you say, meta, uh, metric-based learning? Uh, so, uh, so metric-based learning, uh, basically, it. Uh, so here, uh, the metric that we use is the distance-based uh, approaches, right? So uh, so your question is, can you repeat your question? My question is, uh, is it necessary for the metric to be differentiable with respect to the input parameter, with respect to the parameters of the model? So as an RL, we have we don't have need to have a differentiable metric. We can go with any metric of our choice. So is that a constraint in meta-learning that we need to have it differentiable? Uh, So I think, I think I won't be able to answer. Yeah, probably uh, she doesn't know. So, okay. Anyway, so uh, the metric based meta learning, I am not sure because uh, that's prototypical networks, etc. Right. So there generally it is differentiable, but I'm not sure if we can have non-differentiable parametrics also. Okay. okay. So the second question it. is, uh, you said that the contribution of meta learning is uh, do be by do be not, which yeah. essentially leads to higher order derivatives. So can we circumvent all of this and include higher order derivatives directly in supervised learning and get similar performance? Um, good question. But then you are computing these higher order derivatives on across multiple tasks. Yeah. Right. So that advantage you may not get in the supervised learning. Okay. Okay. Right? Your supervised learning is for one task, one particular episode or task. But here we are combining many tasks. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. You have five minutes remaining. Okay. So we'll very soon go to the uh, Jupyter uh, notebook. So sir, sometime back you mentioned that um, Kavya is working uh, something related to inter um, basically meta learning where uh, plus the change detection like in the direction of concept drift. So I just wanted to ask, do you have any preprint of it which is available we can refer or is it, I mean, do is that work publicly available to refer? Uh, not yet. Uh, okay. I mean, she's still working on it. Not, not, no preprints available yet. Okay. Um, some things which you may look at as, uh, what's your name? Anil, Anil mentioned is that you can use um, um, uh, divergence based measures to see if the current domain is how far the current domain is from the previous domains. So you can find references in those directions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, okay, then we will move to the Jupyter notebook back to Jupyter notebook now. 
okay so like uh, these are the functions that i'll be explaining in a while so uh, okay so uh, everybody is familiar with the uh, kind of setup that i am uh, using for the support set and the uh, support sorry so for the source domain and the target domain so uh, here we will pre train our model on all the eight, all on first eight classes of the uh, fds data set and then we will fine tune it on the target data set that is our eighth and ninth class of the mns data set so okay so here i have actually i have already pre trained uh, the model and uh, i have loaded the weights here uh, and i have uh, shared the jupiter uh, i mean the github link on the chat as well so you may refer to the jupyter notebook as well as the pre saved models and yeah so okay so uh, here uh, find so i am fine tuning on the support set of the target data which is only the 10 samples that i have from uh, from 8 and 9 classes uh, so uh, when when we uh, fine tune it okay so now here uh, the last classifier layer was of uh, was consisting of eight nodes so uh, since there are only two classes here eight and nine so uh, as we as we have seen in the uh, theory that we'll discard the uh, classifier of the pre-trained model and then add a new classifier for this particular task so here i am uh, fine tuning it on the two classes and uh, after fine tuning uh, Okay, so this is the training accuracy that I have got, and then after the and uh, when I am testing the fine-tuned model on the query set of the target data, I am getting around eighty-eight uh, percent accuracy, right? So, uh, the, so first attempt was to uh, see uh, whether the fine-tuning based adaptation works fine or not. It it is working like it's okay. I mean. The performance is okay and uh, now when i uh, switch to the meta learning kind of uh, domain so what happens is uh, as discussed in the theory we have an initial uh, initializer that is theta naught right so uh, so there are two approaches so one is uh, Theta naught can be randomly initialized, or uh, theta naught can be, uh, I mean, uh, that could uh, contain some pre trained weights. Theta, theta naught can have some pre trained weights on few of the classes of the source data set, and the remaining uh, classes can be meta trained on, right? So, in our example, what we have taken is we, uh, we considered first eight classes as a source data set, uh, source data for the uh, sorry support data for the source uh, class and uh, so first on first four data uh, first four classes we have pre-trained our model and for the last four classes we are meta training on it so uh, what i am doing is uh, first i am uh, basically okay so here comes this meta pre-trained data set so meta pre-trained data set over here in the uh, in the data set preparation uh, section one second okay so there it is this block this block basically uh, gathers all the data uh, for the first four classes uh, so that the model is uh, pre-trained on these and uh, the after the uh, the pre-trained model here now will represent the theta naught and uh, that will be used to initialize uh, the theta e's for all the tasks that we will that we will be considering for the meta training part so like is this is this scenario clear what we are trying to do yeah right yes okay so here uh, okay in this particular model i'm just uh, pre-training it on first four classes and uh, we can see the training accuracy it basically shoots up to 98 percent i mean that is uh, that is you know a, a lot of data uh, on the uh, i mean uh, there is a lot of data for per class uh, yes sir on source domain yeah huh. so, so okay now uh, okay now this function is get support and query data set in the in the source domain so what happens is uh, we have the remaining classes like uh, the remaining classes are uh, four five 
six seven right four five six seven classes we have for the mnist data set and now i'm randomly uh, basically generating tasks and each task contains uh, two uh, classes and i have five samples of each class which uh, which uh, basically sums up to n way k short means here n is two and k is five right so so basically this function generates uh, the tasks and it divides the task into the uh, support set and query set okay and uh, here is the meta trained model right so uh, this is the meta trained function that is there and i'll just show you this part because this is important okay so uh, we discussed about the number of tasks that we need so in this particular example i'm taking uh, 80 tasks and uh, uh, so this uh, so this basically uh, this sums up the entire meta learning algorithm so what happens is okay so uh, fine so uh, like we we saw in the theory that we need to develop a relationship between theta e and theta naught right uh, the uh, task space oh okay 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 so uh, right so uh, the first section basically uh, calculates the gradients uh, so that we can uh, direct results okay so like if anybody has a query related to that uh, this you can just come up to me and ask so okay so i have meta trained uh, this model on all the tasks uh, of the support set and then I'm in the meta testing se section. We have uh, like uh, the query, the support set of the meta, uh, the support set of the target uh, domain. I have has only ten classes, right? So we are uh, ten samples, right? So we are just uh, training that on the ten samples, and then what we see is the significant increase from eighty-eight percent to ninety-four percent that we have. Uh, uh while using meta testing uh while using meta learning uh, based method so yeah so this is basically the jupyter notebook the compilation and uh, if anybody has any uh, doubt related to it so yeah feel free to reach up to me or people sir whenever you feel like thank you Thank you, everybody, for um, patiently listening to us. And special thanks to both Vipul and Kavya for this really interesting session. Um, thank you.